Hello and good evening. I'm Graham. Welcome to Lit Quake, San Francisco's Literary Festival. We are streaming live tonight from the Bay Area, and our festival runs from October 8th through the 24th. You can find all the details at litquake.org. Tonight, we are honored to be able to present Missionaries, Military Fiction with Phil Cly and Brian Van Reet. A few quick orders of business before we jump into things. There's a little Q&A function down there at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can click on that at any time and ask either author or questions, and we're going to save a little time at the end to answer them. Um, after we close down tonight, after we close our Zoom, you're going to get a little pop up and it's a survey. Please take five minutes to fill this survey out. This is pretty much essential information for us to uh, approach new donors with and to apply to grants with. So please help us out and fill out a survey. You can further support the writers tonight by visiting your favorite independent online bookstore, or you can find our Litquake bookshelf at bookshop.org. We have both Phil and Brian's books on there for sale. We also ask for your support of the Litquake organization tonight to allow us to bring you these events largely for free. The Bay Area was already a precarious place for artists and arts nonprofits, and now things are even more difficult. If you believe in keeping literature a key component of the Bay Area's cultural landscape, please consider dropping us a few dollars. Every little bit helps. We accept donations on Venmo at Litquake, on PayPal at info at litquake.org, or directly at litquake.org. Now, Let's get on with the show. Phil Cly is a veteran of the US Marine Corps. His short story collection, Redeployment, won the 2014 National Book Award for Fiction and the National Book Critics Circle John Leonard Prize for Best Debut Work in Any Genre, and was selected as one of the 10 best books of 2014 by the New York Times. His nonfiction work won the George W. Hunt SJ Prize for Journalism, Arts, and Letters in the category of Cultural and Historical Criticism in 2018 and his writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, the New Yorker, and the Brookings Institution's Brookings Essay Series. He's on the board of Arts and the Armed Forces, and he currently teaches fiction at Fairfield University. We're here tonight to talk about missionaries, which the Sewanee Review called something new for the canon of war stories, a true 21st century document, and the LA Times called a beautiful, violent, almost perfect new novel. I'm so excited to hear this reading and conversation tonight. Let's invite Phil on up for a short reading to start things off. All right. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Liquake for having me. Thank you uh, to, to, to Brian uh, for being willing to do this with me. Brian Spoils, I got it right here, is, is mind-bendingly good. It's the um, a book when I first read it where <laughs> <laughs> really, I grabbed something. It was like, just listen to this paragraph. Um, it's uh, it's superb. Anyway, um, I'm going to do two quick readings. So there, the first half of the book is in four first person narrators, and I'll read two of them just so you kind of get a sense of of, of some of the voices. And uh, the first one that I'll give you is from uh, Mason, who is a medic in the Special Forces, and this is just his first chapter, the opening of his first chapter, so you don't really need any context. My father was a miner back when that was still a thing. Back when you could be a miner and think that someday your son might be one too. These days, he walks with a stoop in his right shoulder, gift of a rock fall in 83. He's got arthritis and there's a delicate way he gets up from chairs, navigating himself around the damage he's done to his body. He's raging tempers bouts of deep depression, but doing hard work. Physical work, he always told me, was the best way of quieting yourself and fastening your mind to God. When I started out in the teams, I thought it wasn't so different. The work a bridge between my father's life and mine. You could see it in the way a man like Hefe, my team sergeant, prepared his kit, not with love, not exactly, not the way a, a gun enthusiast oils an AR or a suburban dad fastens the bits in his $800 power tool. No, the practiced unconscious care. If you could see that care and then see the way my father prepared, bringing his gear in line, lamp battery, breathing canister, rock hammer, bringing himself in line, each limb, each finger, a piece of equipment, then you'd see that connection. Men like us are always aware of the tools our lives hang on, their capabilities and weaknesses, just like we're always aware of our bodies, 
of our pains and limitations, shot knees, shot backs, sore muscles strung across rough bones. Back then, I believe my father's work digging coal in the Pennsylvania hills and providing for his family really was a prayer, made not with words, but with blood and sweat. And I believe my work was the same, but I was starting to be troubled by the occasional mission that made you question. So that's, um, that's Mason. And then here's Juan Pablo, who's a Lieutenant Colonel in the Colombian military. There's a gringa hen and a Colombian pig. And one day the hen says to the pig, we have known each other for so long and we've always done well together. We should start a business. And the Colombian pig thinks, yes, I've known this gringa a long time, though I'm not so sure I've always done well by her. Still, she's always done well, so perhaps going into business together will work out for me too. And the Colombian pig says, what is the business? And the gringa hen says, we'll sell breakfast sandwiches. I'll provide half the ingredients. You provide the other half. That sounds fair, says the Colombian pig. What's your contribution? The eggs, clearly, says the gringa hen. Clearly, yes, says the Colombian pig. And what about me? The gringa hen smiles. She lays a wing on the pig's shoulder. You, my sweet little Colombian pig, you'll provide the bacon. My daughter told me that story. My daughter, Valencia. She heard it from her professor of law, who is like seemingly every professor of law at Nacional, very much a man of the left. She told it to me the way she tells me every little excess or flourish of her professors with an eye roll, not quite a memento, but almost. She said, echoing what I have told her often before, but for perhaps the first time, I detect a question behind her eyes. Perhaps she herself did not know it was hiding there. There's some truth to that. I told her, but I didn't say more. We don't talk about my work. It's not appropriate for children to know more about it than the honor it's due. And I still think of her 20 years old, beautiful with her mother's eyes and unfortunately my weak chin as a child, but it is true. I, more than anyone would know. After all, for the past 20 years, I have been the bacon. Thank you, Phil. Uh, now I'd like to welcome up Brian Van Reet, who's the author of Spoils, named one of the best books of 2017 by The Guardian, Military Times, Wall Street Journal, and others. A graduate of the Michener Center for Writers, he has twice won the Texas Institute of Letters Short Story Award. He lives in Austin with his family. Let's welcome up Brian. Hello. Hey, how's hey. it going? Good, good. Well, thank you, Graham, for the introduction and uh, for hosting us. And thank you, Phil, for that reading and uh, your kind words. I mean, you can read, you can perform it. <laughs> That's not always the case with highly talented fiction writers. I've been to many readings and some are delivered with much less verve than that, let's say. But that was that was really cool to hear you do it. Um, Thanks, man. Oh, I guess I guess I want to start just by complimenting you on this book, which I think it's it's just great, and I would encourage everyone to read it. Uh, it might be one of the first great novels by a veteran, an American veteran that hasn't been compared to Hemingway, as far as I've <laughs> I've seen. Uh, but it, you know, the name that has come up a few times that I think is apt is Joseph Conrad. I mean, that one makes sense to me. It's you're working on this large global canvas, uh, multinational canvas large, well-developed cast of characters. And it's clear that th their author is not afraid to, you know, tackle the big issues of, of the day head on. Um, and from many perspectives, uh, competing perspectives, there's this line in the book, uh, everything is related to everything. And that seems like kind of an operative thesis at work here. Um, you know, I'm not, there's so much range in this book, emotional range, and in terms of subject matter, it covers it. I don't know if I would call it military fiction per se, but, you know, the military is a big theme here, and this is a discussion about military fiction. So we can proceed from, from that angle, and I thought I might begin by, by uh, invoking this concept that I know you're familiar with and that I've written about some. It's this idea that there are red and blue war fiction books 
and this comes, this isn't my original idea. It comes from this, another war writer, Brian Kastner, who told me mm -hmm. that in his opinion, there are two types of contemporary war books, red and blue. And those correspond to the competing colors of the American electorate. You know, an example of a red war book would be something like maybe Lone Survivor, American Sniper, or for fiction, maybe a war thriller or something Tom Clancy-esque. And a blue book would be, you know, the things they carry, the yellow birds. If you can find it in a supermarket, it's probably red. If NPR reviews it, it's probably blue. And finally, it's worth noting that those are, it's more about, you know, the audience expectations and the marketing strategies and the subject matter to an extent, it, not so much about the actual politics of the author per se. Yeah. Um, but it strikes me that Missionaries is a military themed book that is, you know, st striving, maybe in my mind, striving successfully to sort of break out of this red blue dichotomy of war fiction that governs expectations. And I think one way you accomplish that is by, you know, you spend a lot of time with civilian characters and you have this, this really great non-American military character, Juan Pablo, who you, the passage you read, uh, he's, he's this mid-grade officer in the Colombian military. And I think it's, it's unusual in my reading experience at, at least to find a non-American military character written by an American with military experience who's that well-developed and psychologically complex and central to the story. Um, it's something about including a character like that, almost, it's, it's kind of negating the knee-jerk political charge that can attach itself to Americans when they read about the American military, especially the contemporary American military. I think he's just a brilliant character. He, for me, he's one of the stars of the book, if not the star. And I just wanted to, I would love to hear you talk about creating the, that character, the sure. process that went into it. And then, you know, how did he functions as a, a foil or counterweight, if he does, to some of the other military characters like Mason, and there's another one, Diego, uh, and they have big parts in the book. Sure. So, you know, the, as I mentioned before, there are sort of four first person narratives that you get in the in the beginning of the book. And, you know, one is an American journalist who starts out in Afghanistan. One is Mason and, and you meet him in Iraq. Um, you know, I read from him. One is Avel, which is, is, you know, this kid from this relatively poor region of Norte de Santander, which is a department, sort of like a state uh, in, in, in northern Colombia on the Venezuelan border. And then the other one is, is um, Juan Pablo. And the reason, <laughs> the reason that I did that was I wanted, I wanted to talk about war in a, a, a different way. Um, than I think it, it had been done in the past, maybe, or, or, or then sort of, um, it, you know, I, I heartened to see that you, you said I had broken out of that red-blue dichotomy because, you know, my first book was about Iraq, but the more that I was looking at these wars and thinking about them and thinking about the way that America uses military power around the world and other countries respond to that, the more insufficient it felt to just talk about one conflict, right? Um, because the conflicts bleed into one another, because we live in a globalized world and that includes violence, right? Um, you know, when you can have a, say, a Colombian mercenary on an Emirati airbase watching a Yemeni tribesman through a Chinese made drone before killing him with an American supplied missile, you know, you're at a stage of sort of complexity in terms of how various nations and technologies and types of, of, of tactics and strategies for waging war intersect, um, you know, something that's not going to, you're not going to be able to get at just with a kind of close look at one conflict. And Colombia is fascinating in that regard. I mean, there's a lot of reasons that I focus on Colombia, not the least of which my wife is Colombian American. I have relatives in, you know, Medellin and Bogota. It was easy to go, you know, stay with when I was doing research and they would, you know, hook me up with people to do interviews and, uh, and help me out. Uh, tracking down various things that was wonderful. Um, it's also a conflict that a lot of Americans don't know about. You don't have the um, same kind of political suppositions overlaid onto the conflict because a lot of people don't know we're really involved there, but we have been very involved. Uh, it's been the largest recipient of military aid since the end of the Clinton administration. Actually, Joe Biden was one of the people who put that package together, right? Mm. Um, uh, or helped put that package together. 
and um, and also there's all this kind of interplay between people going from Colombia to Afghanistan or Afghanistan and back. Every ambassador we've sent to Colombia post 9-11 has, has ended up um, then going on to be involved in, in Afghanistan or Pakistan in some way. Two ambassadors to Colombia, their next posting was to be ambassador to Afghanistan. Um, and sort of tactics and sort of techniques for targeted killing that you know, we developed to a very high level in, in, in Iraq, we then helped the Colombians with in, hmm. uh, uh, in their own fight against the FARC and the ELN. So um, it was this, you know, trying to think about <laughs> the way that we wage war in the 21st century meant talking about different conflicts, different players who are parts of different institutions, right? You know, the press, the American special forces, the Colombian special forces, this kid from a small region who ends up in the paramilitaries, right? And the ways in which decisions made at kind of every level of that chain can affect everybody else and have repercussions sort of far beyond, um, <laughs> far beyond where those decisions were made or where anybody ever envisioned them, the, them happening. Um, and so it was, it was my attempt to kind of get at this in, in, incredibly complicated system of modern violence, right? That I think is really important to understand, but is, is necessarily just, you know, you, you start trying to explain it and you start sounding very academic and abstract. And, mm. you know, when you're writing about war, it's really important to be able to, to make that concrete and visceral, right? Um, you know, I mean, I think of, of something like, you know, um, with, you know, what you did in, in, in Spoils, where you have a sort of jihadi character who represents like a less radical version of mm -hmm. um, uh, jihadism in Iraq, who then sort of gets caught up in the kind of power struggles and ideological debates that are happening within the jihadi movement. And then he's making sort of decisions that end up uh, impacting American characters. And I wanted to have, you know, players at different, you know, at different stages, all within their kind of own sort of, uh, you know, their own worlds, right? They, they, they each have their kind of vision of the world, their vision of what they're doing, the kind of ideological sort of justifications that they have for what they're doing that makes sense of what they're doing. But then when you put them all together, you know, you, you see something very different than what any one of them could tell you on their own. And so the second half of the book is in the third person and the canvas kind of expands to include a broader social world. And that was, that was essentially sort of what happened during the construction of the book. For Juan Pablo specifically, you can't, because of the nature of, you know, because that's what I was after, you can't talk about these wars without talking about the decisions made by people in the countries that were impacting, right? And he chafes against the fact that you know, a sort of relatively low level American in the State Department or the military can have these, can make decisions that have huge impact on his country, right? And he's very smart. He's sort of, uh, sort of conservative leaning um, military guy with a sort of fixed idea about what it is he's achieving, what he's leading to the future, but he has a daughter. And actually sort of one of the funny things about writing a book and one of the beautiful things about writing fiction is, um, you, know, you kind of create things that surprise you. I had an idea of who he was and where he was going. And then uh, he was having a conversation with Mason and I needed another character. So I gave him a daughter. Like I needed <laughs> another character just in the conversation to, um, you know, to have somebody to like ping things off of. Yeah. And then all of a sudden she became so much more fascinating to me. And his whole arc became about family yeah. and fatherhood and, and his relationship to his daughter and how his daughter is going to see him and the decisions that he's made and the type of man that he's been in his life. Um, and, you know, her, her own very different type of idealism. Uh, she wants to be a lawyer. She wants to work in human rights or is at least toying with the idea. Um, and her, you know, you know, the things about him that she sees that he can't see about himself, but also her, her own, you know, naivete. Um, uh -huh. And that became like this whole other aspect of him that kind of took over as I was writing the book. And so, you know, you start a book with like this plan for where you're going. And then, and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you start to try and make these characters more real and more interesting. And then they just start going in totally different directions. It's a very chaotic thing. 
That's that is so interesting that to hear that uh, Valencia is the name of his daughter that she was almost mm-hmm. like a placeholder in dialogue, or a, oh. just a, a a conceit of structure that you needed to have another character in the scene. But because that yeah. relationship between uh, Juan Pablo and Valencia to me is one of the best. There's so much emotional weight to it in the book, and it, it works perfectly. So that's so interesting that it was kind of a half an accident. I mean, when I think about family in this book, yeah. you know, half an accident, but not that much of an accident. I think, like you know, I don't think the fact that I had kids well, while I was writing this book is not surprising, right? <laughs> yeah, and I was going to ask you about that because family and family history is so much of a more of a force in this novel than in redeployment. Mm-hmm. And that's not a knock on redeployment. I mean, redeployment wants to be a book, but mostly about young men at war and immediately after they return from war, and and it knocks it out of the park and succeeds in that intention. But it is interesting to, because I've followed your career for years now, to see you as a writer changing over time, to see your concerns changing. And, you know, it makes me think about my own work and how it's changed and how much of the change from book to book might just be kind of like how our lives change over time. And, and so, yeah, I mean, things like getting married and, and having kids, like, it almost feels like you had to do that in a way to write this book. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering how the book changed you. I mean, I can see how you, the changes in your life made a different book than redeployment. Did this book change you, the writing of it? Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think I think it did, and um, that's a hard, boy. That's a hard question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the easy answer is no. Did. I'm just the same as I was before. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, I spent six years on this thing, right? Yeah, and, um, you know, I, I had to learn a lot about, okay, there's, there's the stuff about like modern war and that whole spiel um, that I just gave you. But there's also, you know, the, a lot of this book is just, it's just about thinking very deeply about these characters, right? And what they what they want from life and this kind of like, every character has this sort of mix of idealism and pragmatism, right? Um, and they're, they're, they're inside of, you know, institutional structures that provide them with ways of, of impacting the world, right? Lizette is a journalist, right? So she has a certain set of skills that she can apply within a particular, you know, context, right? Um, you know, she works for a wire service. Uh, uh, you know, Mason is in the special forces. Um, they, and they sort of, you know, push against their institutions. Uh, they sort of critique their institutions, uh, but they're also shaped by them. And they're looking at this complex problem with the tools that have been given them by the institutions that have sustained them and trying to figure out like, how do we, how do we deal with this? How do I, how do I, how do I retain the idealism that led me into this work in the first place? Is that still possible, right? Was I deluded? Um, And then, or is it really, you know, is it really possible to sort of impact things for the better, to make an improvement, to make, you know, this area more stable, to improve this institution so that it, you know, leads to more just outcomes, um, to write stories that are actually impactful. Um, And, and then there's also this question of like, you know, there's our idealism, but then also, you know, you know, you mentioned that redeployment is about mostly young people, right? And a lot of people, some of them, decent number of the narrators, you kind of get a sense, they're going to go over to Iraq and come back. And then maybe they'll get out of the service and go on and do something else, right? Not all of them, but most of the narrators, you kind of feel like that's a possibility. These, these folks are all in careers. So, you know, war is in addition to being all the other things that it is for them, it's a career, right? Mm. And it's a career that gives them a sense of purpose and meaning um, and a paycheck. Mm. On on the subject of uh, idealism meeting harsh reality, there's this great paragraph that I wanted to read uh, from page 250 and just to get your your thoughts on it and ask a follow up. But Mm -hmm. this this is Lizette, uh, I believe Lizette's perspective, maybe I'm wrong, or it's, this is the third person, I think, but we're yeah. getting focalized through Lizette. There yeah. is a naive belief among Americans 
swaddled from war as they are, that merely to tell the stories of the oppressed and victimized is a political act. Tell the stories and the appropriate political answer to the suffering will become apparent. Colombians who've lived with war for decades know better, and they especially know how empathy can be weaponized in the run-up to a vote. But that wasn't what Lizette was there for. I thought that was such a great paragraph. And, I, and it made me think about, you know, it made me think about war literature in the sense of like, is it, well, one, one question was, do you think that empathy for American soldiers and veterans has been weaponized? And in, in a, I can see how it's been weaponized in a political sense. That's relatively mm -hmm. straightforward. I mean, veterans are often venerated uh, and sometimes demonized. But you know, how is it? How is this idea that empathy can be weaponized? Is is it operating at all in war literature? I don't know. It's just a question that came to me earlier today that I not I don't really have a solid answer. But the, just the idea of weaponizing empathy was so <laughs> incisive and interesting to me that. I just I'd like to hear more more thoughts on that and where that sure observation is coming from. Right, and 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 part of the context for that is there's a there was a very divisive um, political campaign that was being run in Colombia at the time against the peace treaty with the FARC, right? Right. And um, so one of the things that was being heavily publicized was, of course, the victims of the FARC, right? Uh, the victims of this uh, communist guerrilla group and. Uh, and so the, and if, but at the same time, the, the guy running that campaign or sort of leading the charge had offered a, a sort of real sweetheart deals for right-wing paramilitary groups, right? Whose human rights abuses were even worse than the FARC, but of course they were sort of on his side. So, right. um, and, you know, in a, in a conflict like this, where you have, Kind of everybody's hands, you, you know, they're the hands of the FARC are dirty. The hands of the paramilitaries are very dirty. The hands of the Colombian uh, military are dirty. Um, there is a way in which, you know, what stories you highlight, uh, it's it's not it's not it's not politically neutral, right? Mm. And I think that yes, absolutely, that is applicable to to war fiction in terms of. I mean, it's also just a, like a matter of what we consider war fiction, right? Mm. Um, because if you think about the main victims of war, they're civilians, right? Um, war fiction revolves around, uh, tends to be narratives of, of combat participants, right, in, in armed services. Um, and it makes sense for various reasons but uh yeah <laughs> i i i think it's all in how it's done there's a way in which so if you take a movie like say american sniper um i i don't think there are any children in iraq in that movie who are not actively um helping al-qaeda in iraq yeah, I could be well, wrong, right? Yeah, if 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 you're not wrong, they're they briefly appear. There's the right. famous scene where where Chris Carl has to shoot the Iraqi child who's about to throw a grenade. Right, uh, um, ludicrous on many levels, but yeah, I remember seeing the this this screenwriter was like profiled in the New York Times, and he was like, "Yeah, in the book, that's not how it happened." But I talked to Chris Carl, and he told me that's the way it really happened. It's like, yeah, dude, like. I'm sure he told you that, but he also said he like punched out Jesse Ventura and like right. shot people from the Superdome. Like he was a liar. Like he was also like apparently an excellent Navy SEAL. He was very good at killing people. He was very good at his job. There's no question about that, but he was also a liar. Those two things can be true. Um, yeah. And, you know, so that in that movie, Iraq is essentially a violent playground for guys like Chris Kyle and then the like, bad guy sniper, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, even that like opening moral dilemma, you're, you're meant to just empathize with how hard it is to have to take on the burden of, of killing a child, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're not ever encouraged to, um, <laughs> to actually think more broadly about the, the context in which 
and which is violence. And the depiction of Iraq is because it is right it pains uh, to make it clear that like people ever uh, uh, dance. <laughs> you know, at Kyle's hands. So that, to me, is a simplistic way in which you could see uh, it being done. Uh, and I think it's a, always a kind of challenge for military fiction in general um, to sort of deal with the complaint that Chinua Achebe, for example, made against Joseph Conrad in which heart of darkness, um, black suffering is landscape, right? In that, mm. in that uh, novella. It's, it's, they're not meant to be um, characters of any import, right? They are the stage for the struggles, the moral struggles in the hearts of white characters. Mm. Um, and the difficulty, and I think complexity of some uh, sort of writing, say that fiction in that regard is you know if you went to if you went to Iraq as an American soldier your relationship to the population that you were you were there with was very limited right mm. um and so uh there's something I think very valuable about writing just sort of straightforward military narratives expressing the the, the experiences and perspectives of veterans, I think it's important for American people to understand, especially understand from a sort of a, you know, whether it's a sensitive sort of thoughtful um, veteran writer uh, or even somebody more brash who's sort of giving you a kind of unvarnished take on, on, on the experience, that can be tremendously valuable, right? Like the, the folks who are over there are doing, are doing those things in our name, right? Yeah. Um, the American military, that's a big part of what we do as a country, right? If you're an American, what we what we do with our military that is a that, that is a part of what it means to be an american like it or not um mm. but uh but there is a way in which uh the sort of um the depict of flattening in ways that are very very flattering to yeah to the veteran, right? Even if, like, oh, or is hell and, right? Uh, and so I think that there are, uh, there are real ethical challenges um, involved that need to be taken serious. Uh, I think that most, I think that most of the, 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 the current generation of war writers take those challenges really seriously, actually. Um, mm. um, but it's, it's certainly there, yeah. I, I have to confess, I, you were breaking up a little bit during that answer, but I caught most of it, and, the, and I think you're right about the the, the, the landscape of suffering. That, that's that makes a lot of sense to me. And and you in this book, you're you know you're telling you tell the stories of victims in this book, uh, victims of violence, and you're also but you also tell the stories of their victimizers, and it's and it feels very round in that way. Um, you know, it's a it's a book about colonialism and empire. I mean, it's hinted at in the title and the, the setting, which recalls the conquistadors. Uh, it it really made me think about the old ways of colonialism and empire versus the new. You know, and and then at the end of the book, I don't want to give it away, but the ending is just great, and it's kind of what you talked about, where you have a Colombian mercenary watching through. Chinese technology and using American munitions to kill people in a country that he's never even been to. Uh, and I think that it's, uh, it, it's so interesting to, to see that, to see war becoming this privatized outsourced thing that's, that's not really done for the old reasons of protecting national borders for God, for glory, gold, or maybe for gold, but for certain people to get gold. I mean, it, it, I, I guess 
I don't even know if I have a question in there, but it, it made me, it's such a complex book that I just, as a writer, I was reading it wondering like what came first here? What was the nugget that started this thing? Because it's too complex to have arrived in that form. And you already mentioned that Valencia was not really a character in your, your first conception. I mean, what was the, was it Columbia? I mean, was it the idea that you wanted to write something about Columbia that sort of connected these conflicts? And yeah. that, was the, the, that was the starting point? Yeah, Columbia um, was a starting point. And, um, you know, there was a, uh, a moment where, <laughs> there's a, an article by Dana Priest, who's a superb journalist about the use of special operations in Columbia. And uh, I think this is in 2014. And I, I was already sort of thinking about Columbia at the time. And it, it was all about sort of the, the aid that we'd given the Columbia in high value targeted and killing these leaders of these communist guerrilla groups. And, um, you know, it had like the smart bombs that we gave them. There's tons of information. I was reading this like, why? Why is somebody leaking all this information now, right? And in the middle of the article, and this was a sort of after surge to Afghanistan, it basically failed, right? It was kind of obvious that it had failed, um, that we'd sent a lot of Marines and soldiers into very violent places where they fought very hard. And you see, was kind of an CP um, or uh, kind of terrorism way in. And middle of the, uh, it says, uh, absurd. And the article was essentially kind of talked about the conflict in Columbus if Columbia was having a hard time and then we gave them smart bombs and things got a lot better, right? It was kind of like the Donald Rumsfeld vision of like with enough technology and high-speed troops, you can achieve anything. Um, <laughs> in the middle of the article says, you know, it may seem absurd to compare Columbia to Afghanistan. And I remember it was just like, yeah, it's absurd. Um, but it seemed as though this was kind of like an argument that was gonna be made, right? That like targeted killings, a light footprint, um, taking people out from time to time will allow us to sort of maintain the presence that we want and achieve sort of uh, broader strategic ends, uh, something I'm very, very skeptical of. So I remember thinking about that and targeted killing as being something that I wanted to track down. And then I started um, focusing on special forces units that had gone back and forth between uh, Colombia, Latin America and and Afghanistan. And there was a kind of whole change in the culture of special forces that happened during that time uh, that became fascinating. So I started with Mason as the first character and then Lissette. And I would write Mason and Lissette in alternating chapters until I'd finished their stories. And then I wrote uh, Avel and um, Juan Pablo in part just because I needed more time to to research Colombia, to be able to get into them, to be able to like improve my my you know not great Spanish enough that I was able to um, you know access the sources and do the kind of interviews that I needed to be able to do um, uh, with the assistance of my my wonderful family um, uh, before I could could really write those sections. And so that's where it began. Uh, and that's of course, interesting. You know, so so you would work mm -hmm. on uh, a, like a pair of alternating stories and then come to the end and then start again, weaving another yep. thread in. That's interesting. Yeah, a, a chapter of Mason, a chapter of Lizette, and then I'd send it to friends uh, and they'd read it and give me feedback. And then I'd go back and then another chapter of Mason, another chapter of Lizette. And then and I sort huh. of got each of their sort of eight chapters. And then I did the Columbian narrators, um, mostly like that. Um, I know what I wanted to ask you that when I was talking about, you know, the stories of victims, but also the victimizers. There's there's this scene in the book where this guy is kind of like a narco warlord. He's killed in a raid by uh, uh, Colombian special forces, and he's he's a character. He's, he's kind of like a part criminal, part part warrior, part politician, sort of like a an El Chapo or Escobar type guy, larger than life. And at the moment of his death, you know, he's losing consciousness. 
and there's no reconsideration of his life choices. There's no moment where he's like, oh, I, I had the wrong goals. I should have been a farmer or something. He <laughs> thinks he thinks this was good. This was a death in combat. This was a good death. And there, those lines are echoed elsewhere in the novel, you know, as other military characters muse about their own popular possible deaths. Uh, some seem to prefer that kind of a death, going out in a blaze mm -hmm. of glory, let's say. Right. Um, Mason reflects on that. And there's a great passage where Mason reflects on his, his true reasons for going back to war again and again. And what he would have told people versus the truth, which is that he kept doing it because it excited him on a literal sexual level sometimes that it was exciting. Uh, he felt alive in a way that he hadn't before. And, and yet he's not presented in a monstrous light. Um, he's actually one of the more reasonable and, and uh, thoughtful military characters. And so this kind of flies in the face of a dog, going back to this red blue thing, you know, one dogma that you would maybe find in blue war literature is that mm. only an evil or deeply broken man could enjoy the prospect of killing and dying violently in a war and but i think that's not the truth and you don't i don't think you think it's the truth either and, no. and, and so that's reflected in those characters and so i'm just wondering like how much irony is involved when you write a line like this was a death in combat this was a good death and how do you reckon with you know, the, the real appeal in the real world that war holds for some participants and not just the very powerful who personally gain from it, but people who actually go out there and pull the triggers, some of them like it, or maybe like is not the right word, but they are, they are drawn to do it over and over again. And how do you do that without making war seem appealing to, to naive or young readers? And because we all have the story of reading Hemingway as a young man, or at least I, you know, I've heard it again and again through generations. I read these books when I was a certain age, and it planted this seed in my brain that, you know, writers or people, whether they're writers or anyone who wants to live deeply, maybe you should go to a war because that's part. That's, you know, it's like leaning over the abyss and looking down and trying not to fall in. I guess. How do you? I guess the question is, yeah. I mean, how do you how do you write something that? where a character can unironically say this was a good death. Do you worry about that? Or do you even worry about that? Am I, because I've thought about that before and I, I ultimately I just say, you have to tell the truth. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But I don't know. It's, it's something that you, it struck me so much because you don't find it in a lot of war books by what, let's, let's say, people kind of like us, like people who maybe are more on the blue side of the, the literary spectrum. And yet I think it really is the truth that a certain type of person, yeah. like that is the death they want, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if, I don't know if people would want to be like, like the, <laughs> the drug lord. Um, well, but some, might, but, but, but <laughs> Ocho, I think, for example, Ocho is a character that Mason is friends with, who I think you know some readers kind of love um uh who's very much on the sort of side of like i'm here to get into firefights right yeah um i'm here he's to very to disappointed sort of be in the, mix. the mission he's he's this character ocho is they have the, this uh deployment to Colombia, and he's disappointed and angry that they are not to do anything risky they're not to go out on patrols yeah. uh it's it's totally antithetical to why he is in the military and he thinks it's a big waste is, of time there's a story that i put into the book it's it's true so i know a guy who's in special forces and and he was talking about this this afghan that he worked with and he loved you know he loved this guy he'd, he'd worked with him on multiple deployments he you know this, he was a great leader um and uh and you know, he's talking about his relationship with this guy and how close he was and that they've been in combat multiple times together. And then, and he's like, yeah, and actually I was there when he died. Actually his last words, you know, he said to me, sir, I need more hand grenades. Like, Damn. man. That's like, the guy you want on your, on your uh, yeah. when you and go goes, the and trench. He, and then, you know, my, my buddy goes, man, just like, love to go out that way, right? Like, and it was like, totally unironic right and this guy's 
not a sociopath, you know, like a nice guy, right? But like, there is this, uh, and, and, a, and a guy with a kind of moral sense of purpose who, who thinks deeply about things and is not unthinkingly militaristic at all. Um, but like that had a very deep appeal for him, right? Um, and it's one of the things that Mason is, is dealing with because, you know, there's this thing where, yeah, the special forces are in Colombia where definitely like the novel deals with a lot of the complexities of the Colombian conflict, but let's just say militarily at that time, it's very clear that the Colombian military is making progress against the FARC, right? So if you're looking at that mission, in theory, that's a successful mission. And then there's these deployments to, to Afghanistan that none of them believe, like none of them believe that after they leave this valley where they just got into this huge firefight, none of them believe that that's gonna be, you know, coalition forces territory in five, 10 years. None of them believe it, right? They all know that's gonna be Taliban as soon as coalition forces leave, right? Uh, as soon as, you know, the US is not pouring all kinds of resources into this fight. None of them believe it. And yet that's the fight that they wanna be in because even though kind of intellectually they understand that it's meaningless, in the moment it feels important. And how could it not? Because their literal lives are on the line. Right, and the lives of the guys around them that they love, that they've trained with, that they're close to, and the lives of the Afghan troops that they're working with, um, and so it just it's it's not just it's not just adrenaline, it's also a sense of meaning and purpose, um, and yeah, Mason even there's like that almost like sexual excitement. He talks about sort of you know going out on a patrol and he's got uh, uh, an OCB and out of control boner. Right. Um, uh, because it has to be an acronym because it's the military. Indeed, the military is a big yeah. fan of acronyms. Um, yeah, that's and uh, like, you know, that's just <laughs> he didn't choose to feel that way, but he feels it, right? right? And he's very thoughtful about the ways in which he thinks the the, the culture of special operations is being corrupted into a kind of more pure almost like nihilistic warrior cult, right? Um, but he's thoughtful about it and able to articulate it because he feels the appeal of it. Right. And I think if you're gonna write about this stuff, you have to write about the appeal. You're, you, like if you, the, the, the important thing, if you're gonna write about violence, right? And you wanna get a handle on, on, <laughs> on how war is functioning, right? If you wanna be able to respond to anything in the world, you need to be able to understand it, right? You need to be able to understand it at the macro level, but you also need to understand how it functions inside human souls, right? And you're not gonna get anywhere if you just pretend that that stuff doesn't exist. Right. I think um, I, I agree with you. Um, yeah, I mean, you don't wanna glorify, like you need to, you know, you need to follow the chain of consequences all the way down if you're going to show that stuff, mm -hmm. but you can't airbrush it. I think that's so true. And, and the, the following the chain of consequences is something you do in this book really, really well. Uh, and it comes across that in a war, mostly the wrong people are killed uh, and often for the wrong reasons. You know, it's, it's just, kind of a chain of events that yes they're causally related in a sequence but people think they're doing one thing when in fact they're doing another thing or they think that they should hit target a for a reason b but really you know target a has nothing to do with what's happening in that area and he might even be trying to resolve the problem uh but he's he's a name he's a no he's a name that's floating around the intelligence community or whatever so there's that, um, there's a great passage on 384. Uh, this is again, Lizette. Uh, and this is where there's this litany of not knowing is what I thought of it as. Uh, and I'm, I might be, well, I'll just read it. She didn't know who had uh, kidnapped her. She didn't know why. She didn't know what their connection to Jefferson was. She didn't know what his real interest in her was. She didn't know why he'd released her. She didn't know what that meant for La Vigia, 
I have no Spanish, so I probably mispronounce it. She didn't know what La Vigia meant for the military. She didn't know what the Jesus is meant for the region. And it just goes on for a paragraph of this litany of not knowing. Um, and then it ends with, so what did she have to, that she could write about some shitty things that had happened to her, but shitty things happen to people all the time. It doesn't make a story. And I, I thought that was brilliant. And it just reminded me so much of what war is, is just this series of uh, awful things that are happening and people making decisions in response um, based on logic. It's not like most of them are, are you know, mad dogs who, who lash out at the, the closest target, but some do that too. And I, I, it really felt like someone, I mean, I, I know you have a deep knowledge of war, but that's the kind of thing that, that proves it. And, and it comes, it, it's, I, again, this is more of just me praising the book rather than a question, but it's, it's such a, a good passage and it really reflects, you know, the, much has been said about the fog of war and that's all true, but the metaphor almost has been beaten to death where you'd, it's, we know that battlefield commanders misinterpret things, but we're talking, this is not just on the battlefield, it's, it's the decision-making that happens with policy and, um, you know, the fog extends much farther than the battlefield, I guess, is what one yeah. thing that you get from this book. Oh. Well, and also just everybody is making, <laughs> is making decisions based on their own interests, the interests of the institutions that they're a part of, um, and their limited view of what's happening, right? And you have, right. like, that's, you have to do that. You have to act in the world and, um, and sort of decisions made at one level affect decisions made at another. What you can do in a novel, though, um, is that you can show all of those. You can show, you, know, you can go into people's, in, 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 into all the actors' hearts at, at, at different levels and show, you know, not just the kind of geopolitical decisions, but, you know, the kind of deeply personal things that are driving people. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's um, you know, everybody's sort of walking around at their own, you know, centers of attention, as Iris Murdoch uh, would say. And yet they're interacting on this kind of larger social canvas where everyone is is connected to each other in ways that they themselves don't fully understand. And in a novel, you can you can show that you can show the interior and the exterior and put it all together, um, and 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 follow these kind of chains of cause and effect into kind of the most startling places uh, that they that they end up going to in reality. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, there are so there. Are, it's one of these books that it feels very naturalistic. It doesn't. The plot feels natural. It doesn't feel contrived or, or stagey or anything like that. But it's it's also intricately plotted. I mean, it's you know, it's we got different time periods, this large set of characters, uh, and how the heck did you keep all that straight? I mean, it feels like this could have been a, a book that would have been, um, maybe one draft could have been 600 or 800 pages and you cut it down. I could also see it being shorter and was expanded, but, and I don't mean to say, how did you keep it straight? It's not the, the great, the thing that's great about it is not confusing. Like you don't even need to necessarily know what year you're in because it does skip around a bit in time, but it, the, the pieces fit together without, you don't have to remind yourself, okay, it's 1999 right now. Uh, it, it's done very well for such an intricate book. And how did you have, you know, what was your scheme of organization? Uh, post boards or just outlining? Yeah, I, the, the first half, as I said, I, I did in the alternating chapters and got feedback from people. So sort of, you know, having a lot of different readers, um, um, uh, Matt Gallagher, uh, Elliot Ackerman, Chris Robinson, my wife kind of, you know, read at various different stages. Uh, other people read little bits and pieces. Lauren Holmes read. Um, uh, uh, um, you refine things as you're going. Set the second half of the novel, which is in the third person, I kind of wrote that all in one long sort of spree of writing. Wow. And then I had like giant math scenes and I put them all into an Excel spreadsheet. 
<laughs> and then kind of reorganize them into chapters and tried to figure out what was missing, what needed to be reorganized. And, you know, I wanted uh, the, 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 the subject um, a degree of in intricacy, but I didn't want it to feel confusing. Um, it was important to me that it really moved, right? Yeah. Um, uh, that it there does. Was, I, I read this. It's a foreign like book, and I of, read it pretty quick. Of momentum. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting you, That's but I was hear. just affirming it's. It is a complex book, and it's 400 pages, but I read it fast, and it, it's a thrilling book. I mean, it's the kind of book I like where it's got it's got uh, heart. Let's say heart and muscle too. You know, it's it it moves. It's good. It's well done. I'm I'm really uh, really impressed. Um, perhaps we should, I don't know if it's time to take questions. We've got a few lining up. Uh, yeah, let's, let's do it. I let's guess do it. you want to, okay. Uh, Jack iPad says, can you both talk a bit about serving in the military and then becoming writers? Was it always in the back of your head or did you decide to pursue it after you left the service? It seems like a big transition to make. I guess I can go first. Yeah. I, I was a writer long before I ever became a soldier or ever thought about becoming a soldier seriously. I mean, I guess when I was a kid, I would play uh, army in the backyard with uh, pine cones and stuff as grenades. But I like to read and write ever since I was a little kid. And um, it was sort of just my luck, good or bad, to be at the exact right age to join the military after September 11th. And, to, I wasn't doing that well in, in college. I felt like it was not real life. I wanted to go experience real life. And I already mentioned that Hemingway was this inspiration to me when I was a kid. I, I still find him fascinating, but my feeling, I guess I have much more complex feelings about him than I did when I was 16 or 17 years old. But you know, so I decided to do this radical thing that mo most of my friends weren't, or actually none of my friends were doing, which is join the army. Uh, and I guess I always knew that I might try to write about it someday, but when I was in the military, I did not write much of anything beside emails, letters. Uh, I was, it's a, it's a tough job, long hours, and I just didn't have the energy to write or, and I didn't have the inclination really at that age to write. So, uh, yeah, it was always in the back of my head and it was always this thing I wanted to do. Um, it is a big transition. Uh, it, it takes some, you know, it takes a lot of time to get good at writing, uh, and that costs money. And my solution was just go to school endlessly from about 2006 to 2012 and try to let other people finance my other education while I was working on, on writing. Uh, but yeah, I was, my self-conception, I, I was a writer long before I was a soldier. Yeah, same for me. Um, I always wrote. Um, it was just like the, the way that I knew how to make sense of the world, I think. And then uh, I never, I didn't really have any thought that I would join the military until, uh, you know, I went, I went to college in 2001, 9-11 happened. Soon we were in one war about to go into another. I always had wanted to go into the State Department, but it seemed like uh, joining the military was the way to go uh to serve my country at that time so joined the military was a public affairs officer which involved you know writing of a certain type um <laughs> and working with some really great like comic correspondents so actually doing a lot of like editing and like talking about journalism and that kind of stuff uh with them that was awesome um and i started writing redeployment when i came back from iraq um i uh, started writing working on the first story uh, a couple months after i came back from iraq and i never thought about you know, I never thought about writing military stuff before, but, um, uh, you know, it was on my mind for obvious reasons. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it's interesting. This kind of brings up a subject that I, that I'm fascinated by, which is, you know, there's, a, when I was on my, my book tour, I was asked variations of the question, like, was this book therapeutic to write? And I was also asked, was it traumatic to write? No one, no one ever asked, was it both traumatic and therapeutic? Uh, and I, it's, it's always, I kind of always maybe, uh, I don't know what the right word is, bristle a bit at that because 
for me, like writing is, is an art. I'm trying to make art. I know that sounds very right. pretentious, but I'm not doing it for therapy. I think for me, the therapeutic part of writing is in feeling like I have a vocation, like, you know, something that I have something to work on in the morning that feels rewarding and, and, and can be rewarding in the real world. And I, you know, that was the therapy, I guess. I feel like there's a, a way of thinking about veterans writing where it's, it's kind of condescending in a way like it's uh, like it's we're working through our issues for, for everyone or something like I remember you told this story or maybe you wrote about this that this you were at a reading and you'd, you yeah. went up on stage and read something and this this woman in the audience was after you were done kind of came up to you and started stroking your back like you were a racehorse who just run a <laughs> just exactly. like I was in a thunder like a horse in a thunderstorm yeah <laughs> right I mean it's that sort it's of very weird that, yeah, it is. You're, it is. You're so brave for telling that story. Right. So Thank I just, you. I don't know, that that kind of, I'm not sure why I got off on that tangent, but the idea of, of I guess, you mentioned that you were, you were working on it right after you came back, and I can kind of imagine, uh, I guess what I'm saying is only a very skilled writer who had been working for years before you ever joined the military could have written that the story redeployment months after returning from Iraq. It's not like going to war suddenly gives you literary chops. In fact, I would not advise anyone who wants to create a career to join the military because it has a way of stamping that out of a person. You know, it, it, I don't think it can stamp it out completely, but I do think it's, a, it's not the, uh, let's say it's not the surest path to artistic greatness, maybe, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, another question, um, Phil. Or did you have a thought on that, Phil? No, no, no. Good. Let's do it. Okay. The next one. Phil, how did you arrive at the title of your book? Yeah. Um, uh, there was like a bunch of titles that we had uh, working through, and missionaries was was one of them on the list, and um, I had a lot of conversation with my wife about it. And it just, it felt like, it felt like the right title um, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a novel about, about forces that are reshaping the world and, and the ideas of the people uh, who are doing that. And um, uh, it, it just, you know, it's, it's, I think if you, if you read the book, it might make, it might make sense, uh, even more sense to you. Um, but it felt like it felt like the right, right thing to talk about. And the novel is in some ways about, um, yeah, it's about, it's about beliefs, actually. It's about the faith that these characters have and not necessarily, there are believers in the book, but uh, in, in God, but um, in various types of things, right? Um, and, and, and whether they live up to those phases or feel betrayed by them or uh, or fail them um, or whether the world uh, suggests that there's there's something lacking in their image of it they had before that's a, i think it's a great title i mean it it fits it's it's good uh, i'd be interested in hearing discarded titles but you, <laughs> you, you don't have to give any uh, Many people don't know that the title of a book is oftentimes not totally up to the author's control. It's part of the, the package, as they call it in publishing, of uh, you know, the cover, the title. The text within the book is, is under the complete purview of the author, but I've had a few friends who uh, the publisher really wanted to call the book a certain thing for, because they thought it would sell. And the author was like, no, 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 you can't call it that. And guess who won in the end, you know? <laughs> uh, but but this is a case where it doesn't sound like you had to fight with the publisher about it, and I think it's a great title. Um, got one one f question: uh, How did serving in the military help you with the self discipline required to be a writer? Well, I I would credit the military for kicking my butt a bit. I mean, I think it it gave me a sense of my limits. And it gave me a sense that hard work will be recognized. Um, 
I think really more than the military though, it was just get the maturity of just getting older um, that helped me get that self-discipline together. I mean, when I was a 20 year old, when even a 25 year old, I, I was, uh, I didn't have it. I, I, I was more of a binge writer, I guess at 25 where I would, I could write a short story in a couple of days and then I wouldn't write anything for, for a long, long time. And that, is not really sustainable, especially when you get more and more responsibilities, family, kids. Uh, I find now that I need to write for, I would say a couple hours a day, most days, although, you know, you take breaks and especially in a time like this where everything's crazy, maybe you take long breaks, but you know, that's the way to produce a book is you got to just put in the time every day or most days until you, you get it done. It's easier said than done. I think it's better that way because, you know, anything good has got to be the product of slow thinking, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was writing in, in my first book, this, there's a story in there called Bodies. And I was writing it when I was, so I was, I was um, student teaching middle school students. I had fifth through eighth, eighth, uh, eighth graders. I actually had my own class because, um, uh, the teacher is a really lovely, sweet lady. Sort of, I think she had some sort of medical situation after like a week or two, um, and then just didn't come back, and they didn't really talk about it. And then I just had like these these kids. So I was teaching uh, 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 student teaching middle school students, and I was taking classes uh, to become like an English teacher at night. Um, and then I was writing, and so on some days I'd be like, you know, going in on the train. And I would write on the train and I'd have like 40 minutes and then I'd, you know, be at school teaching uh, or, you know, or student teaching with another teacher sometimes. And then I'd have like a little bit of time in between before like my grad school classes started and then I'd have time in, on the train right home. And I actually found that like, uh, that was, that was actually a really good period of writing for me in an odd way, even though I was really busy um, mm -hmm. because you know, I would start something in the morning and it would be like percolating all day and then I'd write more, but I'd be ready to go back to it, you know, by the end of the school day and then I'd have another break and then I'd, you know, be working. I wasn't, um, um, you know, I, I, I think the military did help, but I think the biggest thing that the military did for me was it, it made me feel a responsibility to the subject or a passion for the subject mm -hmm. that was different, right? Like, so when I wrote beforehand, yeah, it helped me like figure out the world and all these other things that I say, but like, you know, my goal writing a story was to write a good story, you know? <laughs> and then when I came back from the, from Iraq, I started writing redeployment, like I was trying to communicate something, hmm. right? And that felt very different as, as a goal. That's, that's one of the best answers to that question I've ever heard uh, of how the, uh, yeah, I mean, what you say that the, uh, the intensity of the desire to communicate was so much higher for me after the war than, than the types of stories I was writing beforehand. Uh, and, and I think it just comes from this realization that, holy crap, the stakes really are life and death out there. You know, it's, this isn't just some made up thing. Uh, even in a story where there are life and death stakes, writing that before, and it's and again, it's I don't think it's it definitely you definitely don't have to go to war and experience that to write a story about war. I mean, but I think as a young person, it it, it does have a way of sort of snapping you out of your own reality and in a way that maybe some people take a little longer to get that that sense of. I don't know what it is, mortality or just the weight of our the choices and the, and the, you know, I feel like that, that experience, the Iraq war kind of showed me that in a way that uh, really stuck with me. That might've taken me 10 more years to figure out on my own, if, if left to my own devices. I don't know. It's a really interesting answer. We got maybe with time for one more question. Uh, were there any specific literary works that offered inspiration in writing your novel uh, in maybe tonal or thematic ways outside of research? Yeah, 
Good question. Um, absolutely. Um, so spoils also toggles between different narrators and sort of um, <laughs> people of very different sides of the conflict. That um, uh, So when I read Brian's book, uh, as I said, like it was one of those books where I would literally grab people and read them paragraphs. Um, uh, Marlon James' Brief History of Seven Killings as well, um, in terms really of like getting that. So, yes, I mean, it's amazing. Um, Conrad, uh, 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 you know, I've always been a big, big fan of, of, of Com Conrad with all of his uh, many problems. Um, uh, and one of the things that Conrad's really good on is the ways in which people sort of, you know, there's an event and then there's the way that people sort of have this ideological inflection that they bring to the event and their own sort of worldview that they're coming to it that, that, that shapes how they can respond. And um, uh, there's uh, Juan Gabriel Vasquez, uh, <laughs> it's actually very, very cool because he reviewed the book for the Times. And so it was like, I love, you know, he's this brilliant Colombian author whose, whose novels are absolutely astounding, The Shape of the Ruins, The Sound of Things Falling. Um, uh, so yeah, um, there's uh, a journalist, a Colombian journalist, Juanita Leon, who's got a book called uh, Pais de Plomo, uh, Country of Bullets is translated in English. Um, and it's a phenomenal, uh, I mean, I suppose sort of in terms of American works you could compare it to would be like Dexter Filkin's The Forever War uh, might be a, a sort of similar comparison. She talks about how she's been covering the conflict, you know, with the FARC for years. And there are these things that she always left out of her stories. And then mm -hmm. over time, she realized that the things that she left out maybe were the actual really important things about the war. Um, uh, the sort of small victories and defeats of human dignity in, in the context of these, you know, these communities impacted by the war. And it's, it's each of those uh, sort of essays is just brilliant. Uh, uh, I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I could, I could go on and on, but yeah, there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of books. There's like a, a, there's a index of all the things that I, in the acknowledgements, I talk about a lot of the books that were directly uh, impacting me, but those are the, those are the ones that, that come to mind. Hmm. Well, Phil, this has been a, a pleasure to, to talk to you and it's always so fascinating to hear what you have to say on this subject. And I, I can't wait to read your next one. I hope it doesn't take six years, but if it does, it's well worth the wait. Um, I'm, well I'm, worth the wait. I'm looking forward to, uh, we just already talked about how titles are not in, in, in your control, but do you have a title for what you're working on? Um, not really. There, there are a couple, but, uh, I don't know if I said it now, then I definitely wouldn't call it that. <laughs> I've gone back and forth. I've gone back and forth. Can't say yet. Well, I'll, yeah. uh, I'll look Hopefully forward to you, it whenever you know, it's ready. I'm on, I think I'm on about the six year timeline. So spoilers <laughs> was out in 2017. So maybe, maybe 2023. We'll see. Oh, wait. Uh, you know, good things, like you said, good things take time to percolate. So. This is not a game for the impatient or the rush. That's one thing yeah. I've learned. Even as an impatient person, I've had to <laughs> modify my personality a little to do the writing thing. But yeah, it's it's really a pleasure to talk to you, Phil. Likewise. And uh, thank thanks you. to Liquid for having us. Yeah, I want to I thank yeah. you both uh, for the conversation tonight. That was, that was great. And I just want to say you both are so brave for sharing your stories. <laughs> Wink, wink. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I didn't know yeah, you had it in. Um, at the end of this, <laughs> a little survey, and uh, we'd really love for you to participate in that survey. It should take just about five minutes. And uh, we have about a week and a half left of festival events. You can find all the information at liquidquake.org. We're doing, you know, one, two, three events per day. And then on the very final day, we have our lit crawl which we're usually in person for. It's usually about hundred events. This year we're doing about 25 events online uh, for 12 hours straight. So please wow. join us for that. Yes, it's gonna be pretty crazy for us and exciting for you guys. So um, yeah, uh, hope to see you at future events and, and thank you guys so much. That was really wonderful. Oh, thank our you. pleasure. All right, good night. Good night. <laughs>